Hi, this is Paula from CHNE. Here's a weekly segment with Kay Breton Cancer MP Mike Kellaway, where we bring him your questions. Today we talk about the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and seasonal workers worried about the lack of accessibility to EI in the winter. Here's our conversation. With somebody who's getting the emergency benefit, would that qualify as income and then could they use it to apply for EI later? Uh, great question. The way the CERB is set up, it is set up as a ba basic income, but it wouldn't go towards uh, hours with respect to EI. However, in saying that, um, we, um, myself and my, my staff, have been uh, uh, sending a fair amount of uh, feedback from the riding in terms of when I, when I think of fishers, for example. Uh, fishers have an option uh, right now to take the CERB, but the problem with the CERB um, and I guess it's not a problem, it's a reality of the CERB that it's not insurable earnings. So right now it's, it's considered a stopgap for 16 weeks. Now, might that be um, elongated? Like, might that be broadened out a bit? Uh, the time will tell on that depending on the virus. But right now it's 16 weeks, not insurable earnings, $500 a week, and up to $2,000 a month. We're talking about, about EI, you know, this question keeps coming up. Um, do you have any updates? Because people are worried about the winter. What's going to happen if they don't have enough hours to qualify for EI? And, you know, I asked you this a few weeks ago, so I was wondering, are there any updates on that? Uh, no updates other than uh, updates from my office. Um, actually, yesterday we sent um, uh, a detailed letter. I think that many people uh, can probably get access to um, where we sent a, an email in terms of the recommendations that we're hearing from uh, all fishing communities throughout uh, Cape Breton Canso. And, uh, of course, the extension of EI is one of those, or some type of similar comparable uh, allotment of money for a period of time that would be the same as EI. Uh, so we sent that off to uh, Bernadette Jordan, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Castilla, Christia Freeland, uh, Bill Morneau, and Carol Qualtro, who's in charge of Service Canada, I know I'm not the only MP that has been pushing this uh, particular policy to reflect the, the realities of seasonal workers. Uh, so the, again, the survey provides, I think, a, 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 a good stop gap. But the problem is, is that after it's over, and if you haven't, if you exhausted your EI, where does that leave you? And it leaves you without it, without an income. So uh, the updates there are the continuing updates from my office uh, through um, uh, discussions of both with caucus and individual uh, cabinet uh, ministers to uh, push the Cape Breton cancel reality. But our reality is, is the same in a lot of other areas, PEI, and you know, um, the rest of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and, and, and where there's seasonal work. So we're keeping on um, uh, our advocacy, our major advocacy push to show the recommendations that have come from people in Shetty Camp, people in Glace Bay, people in Cancel, people in, in Guysboro. So, Officially, in terms of a policy or a measure, uh, I haven't heard any indication uh, on uh, what those may be. I have heard there are measures to come, uh, but uh, cabinet confidentiality um, uh, precludes the ministers from telling me even when I'm on the phone and emailing them close to 24-7, which I do, because uh, that's my job. My job is to advocate uh, for the people of the riding. Uh, I'm a member of parliament first and a member of a party second. So I want to make sure that uh, the recommendations that come from uh, the writing are in the proper ears. And that's not just ministers. That's also senior public servants uh, who play a fundamental role, whether it's DFO or whether it is Service Canada or whatever the case may be. So I'm optimistic that our measures, our measures from the office, our recommendations are being reviewed seriously. Uh, we're not the only ones, again, sending those recommendations. There are different fishing associations that have sent those, uh, and also different MPs uh, within the province of Nova Scotia that have been advocating as well. So uh, this past Saturday, we received a, a notification through the prime minister, through his daily press briefing of 62 million for processing and, and processing plants. Uh, in and around anything from PPE to the refrigeration of lobster and things of that nature, which is gladly accepted and a, a, a very strong measure. But we need to do more for harvesters. Quite frankly, bottom line, we need to do more. And as I said on your show, 
you know, our, our approach from, from, from my office, from me, is looking at, you know, what can we be doing to assist those fishers who want to go fish uh, and, and have the capability to go fish? And what can we do for those fishers, those harvesters, that for health reasons, for economic reasons, have another path to go down? And, um, you know, those measures could be an extension of EI. Uh, I can tell you that's what we're promoting. So I'm always honest with the electorate to let, to let them know, here's what we're doing. You know, every day within the past four or five weeks, you know, we've been building on our narrative with cabinet to say, this is what we're hearing from our 50 conversations with fishing associations across the riding. This is what they're saying. And of course, as we've said on your show, you know, there are similarities between fishing areas and there's also subtle differences. And my hope is that we can all put a little bit of water in our wine, as they say, and find some compromises on certain things that are only going to help harvesters and fishers, um, which are the same. Um, but it's around recognizing a couple of things. One, these folks are essential workers. Number two, they have contributed to our food security for, you know, a century and century plus in Canada. Um, and I believe it's incumbent on us to do everything we can to provide measures that are going to keep people whole. What do I mean by that? To, to assist them should they fish, but also to assist if the reality is such for health and economic reasons, they simply can't. And in most cases, health and economic, as we've seen throughout the virus over the past 45, 50 days, they're both, though those topics of health and, uh, and, and employment and the economy are intertwined. So that's what we've been doing. And, and, I, and I have to say, um, the amount of feedback that I'm getting, uh, both via text, the phone calls that we have, the group calls, the individual calls, the email exchanges with fishers, fisher families, uh, people that are in the processing field, people that own plants, people that are owner operator, um, has provided me more of an education uh, than I ever could have imagined on the reality of, of fishers and, and not just the day-to-day -day activities, but just uh, things just around that most fishers, uh, you know, captains will you know, pay their individuals uh, uh, in a different way. They don't necessarily have a business number, but they may pay that individual through personal check. And that's stuff that I'm learning. And it's also stuff that are, is helping to inform some of the other measures that we from my office have put forward to say, some of the measures around helping uh, companies uh, with the $40,000 interest-free loan over two years, a lot of the fishers that are in our riding can't apply because they don't have a registered business number. So what, what we've suggested is that the monies that are going to, the new monies that are going to ACOA, for example, this is what we suggested, um, to help small and medium-sized enterprise around operators needs to have um, um, that in mind in terms of there are businesses like in the fishery and like in the creative arts that do not have that business number, but you know have different ways by which to pay uh, people that work for them or pay them themselves. And we need that flexibility in funds like the, uh, the new ACOA fund that will be coming out soon to, to, to recognize that and to provide funds for those groups. So these are the things that, that, that I've been so impressed with with our riding. Man, the talent and the, and, and the ideas are, are flow. It's not just concerns, and that's important too. But it's these solutions that uh, that come up, and you know, I, I get calls all hours of the night, and I, I take as many as I can. Uh, but it has absolutely been a collaborative effort between my office and the constituency, and and, and the constituents, uh, no matter what sector. But in particular, the fishery uh, has been one uh, that I'll, I'm not going to lie to you. I um, I, I, I share their anxiety when I'm listening to them around. How are we going to make ends meet? What is the market going to look like? How can we fish if the market value of a lobster is three dollars and you know per lobster? These are real concerns. And and then there's the health items that we talked about in the past with respect to, as I said to someone on a call a couple of days ago in Ottawa, some senior public servants that you know if you look at the fishery in our riding, most if not all the fishery is located in rural Cape Breton in rural northeastern Nova Scotia where there may be 13 to 2,000 people, you know, and we need to be cognizant that if, if something were to happen in terms of someone to catch corona, that the resources to be able to respond are different in a rural area than they are in an urban area. You don't have finite resources. So that means that we have to plan and we have to be 
absolutely new, no room for error in terms of ensuring that people are not at the docks that shouldn't be at the docks, those type of things. So you have all of these variables at one time coming at you. The economy, health, not-for-profit, seniors, youth. And so the government, again, has tried to take a whole government approach. So taking, taking a broad swipe at trying to help as many people as we can in the first go around. That's why you've seen 8 million, 8 million people apply for the Canada Emergency Response Act. It's staggering. Those that have applied for the $40,000 uh, interest-free uh, loan, um, that's uh, I think around 200,000 businesses so far. Um, but again, with each day that passes by, you say, okay, this measure, this policy doesn't impact and doesn't help this group in the fishery or this group in the forestry. Um, we need to do more for seniors. You know, uh, you know I'm hearing that. I have been hearing that for some time, and the Prime Minister has talked about that something is, is in the near future is coming with respect to seniors. So as we go through this, and as we um, you know, get into the seventh week and eighth week and tenth week, and we get into June and July, you know, we're going to have to then look at, uh, as the Prime Minister has talked about today and yesterday, looking at a strategic and staggered approach of opening the economy. We would have to look at the health in six weeks, the health aspects of Corona, that's, going to not, that's not going to change. But we're also going to have to look at how do we stimulate the economy? How do we look at projects that provide return on investment? And that's where, you know, things such as infrastructure projects will, will come in. And, uh, you know, we're, we're focusing on the, the income of for individuals now from a business perspective and individual. But there's going to be a time very soon when we'll, well, it's not that we're turning the page on this, but we're also going to have to take that one eye that we're looking at the health and the income of individuals now and look at how do we improve it on a daily basis. But at the same time, looking at the economy and looking at investments that are going to lead legacies, and that's infrastructure projects, things like water, wastewater, um, roads, things of that nature that are going to put people to work, but that are also going to provide a return on investment. And these are things that will help stimulate the economy and also help people go. But that's you know, for a little further down the road. Right now, um, when we talk about EI, we talk about CERB, we talk about commercial loans or commercial rent relief, we talk about um, the Canada student, uh, summer student jobs, and we talk about uh, other measures that are going to help students uh, that can't find work to, to pay the bills, whether it is through an allotment a month or an allotment in terms of a stipend to do community work and, and work on with different community groups to help build community capacity in, a, in this new era. So it's a scary time, but it also, I think, can be uh, a time that we can spur on community innovation. And I think of communities like uh, Palm Cat or Shetty Camp or Arishat uh, or, or Glace Bay or Guys, any town in Guysborough County, when we look at things such as food security. Well, we, we, you know, the discussion has been going on for some time around the need for local communities to do more with respect to food security. Well, I think we've illustrated that we're gonna to need to do more in this COVID and post-COVID world. We're gonna to need to do more in terms of broadband and cell phone coverage. This past week, uh, I took part in the first virtual parliament. So 299 people on the screen via Zoom. And I absolutely thought it was a huge success. I, I, I really did. I, I enjoyed every aspect of it. I thought it was there were great questions. I thought the decorum was civil. And I thought the modality of it and the ability to maneuver were just pretty easy to do. And it got me thinking is that, you know, what can we do in terms of government and community engagement through what we're doing here through your team? What could we be doing more around uh, community work or MP connectivity to, to the constituents? You know, we have, uh, I think, been innovative in putting forth uh, the roaming office, which we'll continue to do once we get the go-ahead from health officials. But it's got me thinking of how can we do community Zooms? How can we do like one night in Grand Tang with community Zooms? And, and, and I know some areas have great connectivity, some have so-so connectivity, and some, boy, it's pretty bad. But it got me thinking that infrastructure like IT and broadband and cell phone coverage is no different now than roads. You need it for occupational health and safety, you need it for community engagement, and you need it for rural economic development. 
So we're also pushing that as well from, from our office. We spoke last week about essential workers with underlying health conditions or who live with somebody who has an underlying health condition. Um, a lot, I've heard from people who have underlying health conditions, but because service only four months and like we, we spoke already about this, you know, they don't have EI, they're still going to go fishing. So that that's something that's going to happen. My personal belief is that, uh, again, I, I think I think very highly of CERB and, it, and its intended outcomes of providing a basic income for 60 years. Um, but it's not a one size fits all uh, solution. And fishers are an example. So, I mean, if you have the choice between um, uh, not going fishing and looking at 16 weeks, that's your choice. To make. But if, if you're looking at it from what happens after the 16 weeks, I could understand why. I mean, if it were me, I'd probably look at it. I have a family, I have, I have bills. I'm probably going to go, well, I need to go to fish, number one, to make an income, but also to, to make an income through, to get me whole to, to April. So that's why. Uh, in, in my letter to, to, to cabinet, I talk about, you know, there's a timeline here when it comes to either expanding CERB, if that is one path uh, to, to, to next year, to April, or looking at some type of an extension of EI. And the timeline is that we have May 15th approaching and hard to believe I'm looking out uh, my patio door and there's lots of snow uh, in the backyard. Uh, it's April 30th. Um, May 15th is the designated time to fish. Uh, we need to, uh, in my opinion, we need to uh, look at the timeline before April, May 15th to, in, to ensure that if we have these measures, they come out before people make the decision to fish. Now, you know, I've had plenty of discussions internally uh, with government officials on this. If hypothetically it is an EI, uh, EI measures, let's say it is, um, if an individual is on EI and for whatever reason, uh, things look brighter in terms of COVID during that time and things change for the better in, in a major way and markets, you know, are, you know, through the roof and everybody, you know, that doesn't preclude someone to getting off EI because that's what EI is for to go in and, 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 and to fish if they so choose. You can't do both, but you may have that opportunity where you start off with EI, there may be an opportunity to if the economy picks up and the fishery picks up and the markets are just going gangbusters that you you could look at that but that's highly not probable at this point so again my my recommendations and my advice uh to the uh, to the federal government is that two prong pathway you know uh, ei to the end of uh april or 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 serve i don't care how we get there as long as we, you know, in my opinion, as long as we get there. And, and then measures to, to assist on the health side for fishers that decide to fish, uh, you know, with, with respect to PPE and other types of health protocols that are both a provincial uh, primarily and, and some federal responsibility. So as an MP, my job is to advocate for what I believe I'm hearing and what I believe is right and what, what makes common sense and what the art of the possible is all about. So that's what I'm doing. Um, and I, I say this on so many calls, I, I never promise anybody anything because I think that's a fool's error because things can change pretty drastically as we've seen, um, you know, from, from day to day. But what you can count on is, is, is me taking, and I have, and people know this, taking the recommendations that come from People in my office, myself and fishers from all over the riding to Ottawa to say, here's the recommendations, but here might be a, a, an interesting way to help more people. Here might be an interesting way to keep people healthy. Here might be an interesting way to actually help the economy on the fishery. And we put those forward. And, you know, we, um, a lot of times we'll hear back from ministers. Um, and I think of, uh, Melanie Jolie, whenever with respect to some recommendations we made to Wakala, uh, it was a very good conversation. Uh, Bill Morneau's office on uh, the original CERB, we, we came out because I've been advocating before COVID for a basic universal income pilot for Cape Breton Cancel. Uh, I believe wholeheartedly uh, in uh, the concept of basic income. 
uh, I think um, it is something that we'd be talking about in two and three years anyway. So let's talk about it now. And there's so many great organizations nationally. Uh, I think of uh, a group with uh, Dalhousie and, and local community health associations that are looking at the economic case for a basic income. So let's as a country have that discussion. Let's as a region have that discussion. Let's as a Rhiney have that discussion. And in fact, two weeks ago, we had that discussion. I brought in people via Zoom uh, throughout uh, the riding, uh, Shetty Cab, Guysboro, uh, Inverness, and, and, uh, and uh, Richmond County and the CBRM, uh, basically people that are working in the social service sector. And we had a great discussion and we're gonna start drafting some ideas for pay, uh, to put on paper for me to, to explore and, and, and navigate and advocate uh, when uh, we go back officially uh, in, a, in a different form. Uh, with respect to, to the House of Commons. So to answer your question on that, um, yeah, there, there, I think there's a timetable and time is ticking on, uh, you know, EI measures to help uh, fishers. And uh, it's uh, something that's on my, I'm not even gonna say it's on my radar because that would be redundant. It's on my radar, it's on, it's in my, on my mind every day um, and approximately five to six calls a day just on the fishery alone and, and the riding, um, keeping up to date, allowing people to voice their concerns in some cases, in some cases to voice their appreciation. Uh, but in all cases, it's all civil. Uh, people are worried, they're hurting, uh, and we need to make sure that we got their backs. You can send us your questions from Michael away at chne.television at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.